Uh, hello everyone, um, I'm going to be giving a talk about the state of full disk encryption. So who am I? Uh, my name is Hugh, my nick is Aquaman, my Twitter handle is Aquaman. it's just Aquaman with an H on the front, Aquaman was already taken. I come from Wellington, IT apparently, uh, I work for Catalyst IT, that's probably where the IT came from. Uh, they paid for me to be here so they're big ups on them. Uh, Catalyst IT is a basically web development shop that does a lot of open source type stuff. Not strictly web development, but yeah, a lot of open source stuff. And so yeah, cool. I also have an interest in security, hence me giving this talk. So why do they call me Aquaman? It's not because I'm a superhero wannabe, it's because I drink a lot of water. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be talking about these topics today. So encryption, the NSA in your machine. <laughs> I'm now more encouraged to start with my own thing. You should Testing. Hello. 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 Can you hear me in the back there? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Minion is a politically incorrect term, I've been told. When, the, when there were two people doing my job, I wasn't allowed to call him Minion because he was shorter, younger, and less experienced. I had to call him colleague. I think that's the French term. Colleague. No. Is that testing dialogue okay? Yeah? yeah. Cool. All right then. Um. Sweet. Whenever I'm ready. Yep. Right. Oh man. Ooh. We'll just have like flickering things. I might open that. Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, I'm wiping it when I get back. Uh, yeah, so encryption, types of full disk encryption, problems with full disk encryption and possible attacks on full disk encryption. So just before I get into it, show of hands, who encrypts their computer in any sort of way? Uh, that's a good show of hands. Like completely full disk or just like home partition? Yeah. Excellent, this should be an interesting talk. <laughs> so what is encryption? You guys all know this. So encryption is basically the process of taking some data, applying some cryptography to it to produce more data that's unreadable without having a key to decrypt the data to get back the original form. So it's different from hashing, which you might have also heard of, and that you can get back <laughs> uh, you can get back the original data, but no one else will be able to without having the key. So what's disk encryption? It's just encryption applied to a disk. Pretty simple. So you can use encryption on a file or you can do it on whole disk. Some people do it just for partitions, so encrypting just your home partition where all your data is is quite common. I personally do the whole thing. So full disk encryption is encrypting the whole disk, but usually there's a plain text section which is used to bootstrap the loading, because you need to type in that passphrase somewhere. Wonder what does that. So types of full disk encryption. Uh, who here uses Windows? Oh, a 
couple of people, good conference to come to. Uh, <laughs> and if those people that use Windows encrypt their disks, do they use BitLocker? Or they don't encrypt their disk, excellent. Uh, there's also TrueCrypt, which is an open source thing, but it's kind of not being developed on and it's not secure as, which is also an acronym for NSA. Take what you want from that. File Vault, used for Macs, so those people that use Macs use File Vault. Uh, Linux, there's a thing called Lux, or there's even lower level stuff if you really want to get into that. I use Lux because it's easy. And if you're really wanting to throw your wallet away at things, uh, just use hardware encryption, which again, do you really trust because when does that hardware get made and all that. So, what are some problems with full disk encryption? First problem, you've got uh, the unencrypted boot partition. So the boot partition is not encrypted in most full disk encryption setups, and that boot partition has a sort of bootstrapping function to let you put in your passphrase to decrypt the rest of the disk. But it's unencrypted, so anyone could make their own thing. More on that later. Plus, once you decrypt the system, the key is stored in memory. Sure, you might not be able to get it out of it, but there's some attacks on that. The other thing is, if I take my laptop, which is fully encrypted, and go through an airport security, and they want to look at my laptop, it kind of looks a bit suspicious, because it's just got a lot of random data on them. And they might flag me as some terrorist or something, I don't know. And it's not so much of an issue anymore, but it is minutely slower, but with processors these days, it's pretty moot point. So some attacks on full disk encryption. These are just some of the ones I've come up with that uh, you people might not know. Some people might know them, but they've got awesome names as well. So we've got a cold boot attack, and we've got an evil maid attack. Uh, we can have vulnerable code in the encryption software, and we can have just general disk corruption, which is a problem with every sort of hard disk type thing. There is a common theme on all these attacks, is that physical access like just overrides everything. If someone had my laptop for like five minutes, they could do anything. They could do any of these attacks, and it worries me. But, oh well. So, cold boot attack. Who's heard of a cold boot attack? A couple of people. Who protects against a cold boot attack? <laughs> Not as many people. I didn't think that was the case. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned before, the key to the disk encryption is stored in memory. So once you're decrypting, this laptop here, it's running on a decrypted system, so my encryption key is in the memory somewhere. It can be retrieved. If someone just came along, yanked my laptop away, uh, cut the power, freeze the RAM, basically use a, uh, some sort of coolant, or you can just use uh, compressed air, and then load a custom kernel via a USB stick or something, they can dump the entire memory of my laptop onto some other system, and they can grab through that and find the key and make some money, because I have heaps of money on there. My Bitcoin wallet, yes. Lots of money. I'm rich. So that kind of sounds bad, and it kind of sounds reasonably feasible. Like, people can and have done this. It's not a theoretical thing. So, easy solution. Just whenever you leave your device unattended, turn it off. Don't leave it running all day in the hotel room. Fairly simple. Evil Maid Attack. I love the name of this, because... <laughs> Who, who here has stayed in a hotel? Or any sort of, pretty much everyone, right? Who here has left their laptop at any time in their hotel room? <laughs> so what this is, is every day you're in your hotel, your maid comes in and cleans up your room. But pretend your maid is evil and they're called Mallory because that's an evil name. <laughs> Now remember how that uh, encrypted disk has that unencrypted boot partition. They could change that. They will change that. So they take your laptop, it's turned off because you are protecting against cold boot attack, but it's still there and that unencrypted section is still unencrypted and they can still overwrite that. So they do. And 
it still asks for your passphrase when you come back and turn it on and looks all normal to you, so you type it in. Problem is, it now takes your passphrase and sends it off to uh, Mallory over some, uh, I don't know, hot spot in the hotel. There's multiple ways, or she could come back and get it later the next day. Problem is now, she's got the encryption key and she's probably got a copy of the entire encrypted disk so she can just decrypt it. And she's got some money, because all those bitcoins on my laptop. So how do you protect against the evil maid attack? Don't leave your laptop unattended. Is that actually feasible? Can I actually just carry my laptop around me all the time? Oh, that, that's like a couple of slides away. <laughs> so yeah, um, it, it's not really feasible to take your computer with you the whole time. Like I, I got a bag, I'm used to carrying it, so I do actually take my laptop most places, but there are times I get bored of carrying like 5kg or whatever that is, and I leave it somewhere. Like last night at the dinner, I actually left my laptop under a table for half the night, so I have trust of the table. <laughs> maids. <laughs> the next thing to do is maybe verify the boot partition so when you turn it on you could have like a separate disk that runs through and checks that that boot partition is the same thing but what's the point of that when you can just have a separate boot partition on a USB key so that is my boot partition among other things. So if you do that, now I can leave my laptop wherever and when I come back and want to turn it on, I plug in my USB key and that it boots off the USB key and not off the hard drive and the hard drive is fully encrypted. So that's a pretty good uh, solution. Or is it? I mean there's all these hardware level attacks, so like if Mallory had access to my laptop, she could put a keylogger on the keyboard or like use some bad USB type thing or any sort of thing. So how much do you actually trust in hardware? Pro tip, don't trust anything, but trust everything. I forgot my tinfoil hat, they wouldn't let me through customs. Uh, but yeah, in the general gist is this is the best way to do it, just have a separate key on your key ring, always have this on you because hey, who carries keys around with them everywhere? pretty much everyone. Vulnerable code. So most of what I'm talking about is uh, software level encryption. There are ways to do it on hardware level. I'm not sure I would trust that as well because hey, do you really trust the hardware? Like where'd you get it from? Who made it? Do they have allies in the NSA or anything? But vulnerable code, uh, general gist is update your code regularly because if there are security flaws, they will come through and if you don't update your code, then someone can find your laptop that hasn't been updated in 10 years and hey, they can just get in because there's that massive vulnerability from 10 years ago. Next step is to roll your keys. So your encryption key is sitting on there. Uh, if you roll your keys every year or so, then even if someone gets a copy from 10 years ago, they can't brute force it as easily. Well, they kind of can if they've got a copy of it, but yeah, maybe that's, you should still do that. Uh, don't use TrueCrypt because it's been shown to be not as safe as, not safe as something else. NSA maybe. Uh, but do use open source, uh, but only open source that has been verified. How do you verify things? I mean, who here has read the entire source code of OpenSSL and understands it? <laughs> There's no holes in OpenSSL, right? Or Bash, or like heaps of other things that have been around for like 50 years. So can we really trust all that security? I mean, we kind of do because we're computer people, but best thing we can do is update regularly. And if we're knowledgeable, we can also check the code and find new bugs and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, disk corruption, so on the encrypted hard drive, because I use Lux or Lux and not like underlying dmcrypt, uh, there is actually metadata stored on the disk and you can actually just overwrite that and I lose my entire system. You can get around that, uh, but it then 
if the attacker has the time and the patience to actually have physical access to your computer and corrupt it, they could probably just corrupt the whole thing. So that's it, uh, but I'm hoping that other people want to discuss more on like sort of full disk encryption, any horror stories they might have, anything else they want to do. So I've had just a couple of points here, but I know a bit more, so questions welcome. Ben. Um, hi, you mentioned TrueCrypt and don't use it, especially because of all the things that changed. So I don't know if everybody else here knows what happened, but essentially the uh, patch came out and they said we're no longer supporting it and all this weird stuff went on. But from my perspective, TrueCrypt, the source code for TrueCrypt hasn't, hadn't changed for years before that. And then suddenly there was a change. There's some talk that uh, the changes that were made most recently may or may not have introduced some kind of vulnerability that may or may not have been at the behest of some rather large organization with strong muscles. Uh, and if nothing had changed for years before that, is TrueCrypt, the version before the one that's just been released, still considered safe in the same way as we would trust any other open source software? Uh, I would probably agree with that uh, in the sense that we have trusted Bash for 25 years and then a couple of Bash run releases came out. But then we would uh, trust it a lot more if it had had a security audit. So at this point in time, people should be going through TrueCrypt and doing a security audit, which is what people have been doing with OpenSSL and Bash and all those products. Am I thinking of the right product? Was there a security order being done on TrueCrypt? I think somebody had started one, a crowdfunded one. Someone started one, but I'm not sure why it actually came from that. They were going to continue auditing the old version, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I might need to look into that again. I'm not sure what's come from that, though. I mean, I haven't heard anything in the news, so I assume nothing's come from that, or they stopped, or <laughs> trust what you want, I Thanks. guess, from that. So what's your view on sort of hardware level encryption? I'm not talking about hardware level disk encryption, but uh, you know, all of the, the recent Intel CPUs have got accelerated instructions for doing AES and stuff like that. And a lot of things just use that by default. It, would you, are you cool with using that sort of stuff? Or do you want to actually just see every AES round being written out in code and so I, you can follow I would uh, trust the AES encryption in hardware level because with the hardware level encryption, they're using open standards, like AES is an open standard, and you can verify it does the right thing. So if you're using the Intel AES uh, module, you can compare that to something generated on just a CPU, and if it's the same, up for like a million results and you've got some level of trust in it. Any other questions? Discussions? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, with TrueCrypt, uh, BitLocker was the preferred recommended alternative for those currently using. Uh, how do you uh, perceive um, BitLocker as an open and kind of publicly verifiable source if it's not an open source tool? It's developed by Microsoft. Uh, I personally wouldn't recommend BitLocker because I don't use Windows and so I guess that answers that question. I don't really have much trust in proprietary software. Neither do I. Excellent. We're in <laughs> Yeah, well, there's that. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. This might be a naive question, but I didn't quite follow the cold reboot attack. Uh, the cold um, boot so attack. What, what I didn't get was, um, does the attacker freeze the memory before they reboot it? Or do they turn the machine off and then freeze the memory? So uh, how it's I, normally... I didn't, I didn't quite follow what, how protect, protecting your system by turning it off would protect it if the free, attacker freezes the memory after you've turned it off. Right. Did you see what I mean? There seems to be a conflict yeah. there that I don't understand. So what normally happens when you turn off your computer using a safe method like pseudo halt or something like that is it will actually wipe the memory as it shuts down. Whereas if you just do a... So it's called a cold boot because like a warm reset is like you push the reset button and it does that, whereas a cold reset is you actually cut the power and you turn it back on. So with a cold boot attack, they're just cutting the power, they don't give the operating system the chance to actually clear the memory. 
and then at that point the memory data is still imprinted in the memory chips so if you freeze the memory so that it doesn't wipe uh, once it warms back up you can load your custom firmware and read all the memory off in like a certain amount of time so like you're looking at a couple of minutes thank you no worries yep uh, just to quickly mention uh, for people who are using uh, BSD systems or FreeBSD, there are two options for full disk encryption that are in the kernel. Uh, one is called Jelly and one is called GBDE. And uh, they have different cryptographic schemes to address slightly different threat models. Um, but yeah, if you're not using Windows or Linux or Mac, you might be using FreeBSD and yeah. those are your options there. Thanks for that. I didn't look that up. Um, hot desking laptops and sharing keys and stuff, uh, any thoughts about that? Sorry, what? Uh, we, we share uh, laptops at work. We yeah. are moving and swapping around. Like, I don't have my work laptop, but I've got some stuff. Uh, do we use all the same key? Are there ways of having multiple keys unlock different laptops and things like that? Or so if you're using if you're using Linux, say you can use the Lux system, and that uh, allows you to have multiple keys that unlock the master key that decrypts the disk. So you could have a key for every developer or key for every user of the laptop, and they type in their key, it decrypts everything, and when that person leaves the company, they can just revoke that key. Um, so I, I would recommend that if you have to use shared laptops. Anyone else? Um, protection against this corruption. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you and how do you protect against this corruption? So protecting protecting against this corruption would just be backups and replication. The so it's a similar attack to just normal unencrypted disks. Your disk might get corrupted. So have backups on off-site locations, have replication, have all that nonsense. <laughs> and have a way to verify that the backups are indeed correct. So you might sign the uh, backups or something like that. Does that sound good? Yeah. Anyone else? I love questions. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things I really liked about TrueCrypt, and I seem to be harking on about it, I don't actually like it that much, but there was a fantastic <laughs> thing in it, which was the plausible de deniability. You could have a container that would yeah. allow you to log in with one key phrase and unlock one version or an embedded container inside it, so you could keep your super secret stuff in there, and if the three-letter acronym organization asked you to unlock it, you could use your, your um, what's that thing in, in um, sadomasochist side? There's the safe word or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, uh, whatever. So you could use a different passphrase to unlock it and in there you could have some semi-secret-ish looking stuff so that it looked like that's what you're protecting but in fact the stuff you're protecting cannot be seen. Can you do the same thing at a full disk level encryption? Could I log in with one password and have suddenly uh, a file system that shows a standard normal user that uses Gmail f for their email for when I go through airports mm -hmm. and then when I'm actually at home I log in with a different password and there's my normal Thunderbird setup with uh, Enigma and the rest of it. Is that so, an option? So I haven't seen anything like that. So plausible den deniability is quite a good thing, but it's also kind of traceable because you've got a large chunk of space that is unaccounted for. Um, w with Lux, there is a patch somewhere in the system to have a kind of wipe option. So you type in your secret passphrase and it just wipes the system. Well, it just wipes the master key, so that will stop that. But I'm don't think there's one for plausible deniability, like you have two encrypted zones, but it's probably possible and it's open source and. Patches yeah. <laughs> I know that uh, TrueCrypt does have a plausible deniability uh, feature, and you also have the ability to enter your, your kind of secondary key uh, with or without knowledge of that um, hidden partition. So you can log in and it looks as though the entire disk belongs to that particular partition. 
to the to the that um, you know your your intent partition. So you can actually mask the fact that you actually only um, you know um, violating security on part of your Oh yeah, so that was the plausible deniability in TrueCrypt. You can put in the passphrase without knowledge of the other one, and it shows the full disk. Yes. It so looks, it looks like it is, but you, you know, if you started writing to that, then you're, yeah. you're writing your... Right, oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. But don't use TrueCrypt. Yeah. It's... Still don't use it. <laughs> uh, there was one over there, I think. Ah, no worries. Anyone else? Crickets. Have you, have you ever tried doing the cold boot thing, like freezing your RAM and trying to see how it works? Yeah, I've done the cold boot thing before. Um, it, it's pretty fun and it, it's possible and you're like, wow, that works. So um, modern systems, the key that you put in isn't the passphrase. So the passphrase is in the memory, but the actual key for the disk is. So you have to work out where in the memory it is and then use that and try and decrypt it and see if it works and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, it does work. It's kind of fun. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Cool.